As you're standing, I'm going to read from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Prayer of David toward the end of his reign as he was preparing for the building of the temple. He gathered all the materials, but God said, you're not the one who's going to build. Your son Solomon will build. And so the people came and gave offerings and materials for the construction of this place where God's spirit would dwell, where people would offer sacrifices to God, where they would offer their petitions to him and he would hear and answer prayer. And so in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10 and 11, we read, 1 Chronicles 29, 10, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. I want to preach for a little while tonight the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You may be seated. The kingdom, the power, and the glory. Those words may be familiar to you from the Lord's Prayer as it's traditionally uh, pronounced or uh, recited. But perhaps you didn't know that this actually comes from the prayer of David. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, the King James Version, we have the Lord's Prayer, and it does end with that phrase, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Luke's version, Luke 11, he doesn't include that ending. Some ancient manuscripts don't include it in Matthew either, and so some of the scholars or critics say, well, it shouldn't be there. But God does not leave his word without a witness. And regardless of the precise scholarly details, we do find these words already included in prayer in the Old Testament. So it's perfectly appropriate to end our prayers. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful phrase and it has a wonderful meaning. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes tonight. The kingdom, the power, and the glory. If you read David's prayer, he first of all says God is eternal. God is forever and ever. What a comfort to know that our God was before time began. And our God will be after time ends. There's no place or time where God is not. When you put your trust in God, you're not just trusting in the latest fad or fashion. You're not just hoping that this is going to work for a little while longer. But you're tapping into eternity. Before we ever existed, God already was. And even until eternity future, God always will be. He is truly forever and ever. And His kingdom, His rule is forever and ever. In the Lord's Prayer, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew chapter 6, it begins in verse 10. Of course, you know it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. After that initial acknowledgement of God's greatness, that his name is to be set aside and made holy. It says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a petition, Lord, your kingdom come. Let your reign be manifested. First of all, when we pray that prayer, we're asking for his kingdom to come in our lives. Others may not serve God, but we shall serve the Lord. Others may not listen to the word of God, but we want to hear, understand, and obey God's word. So if nobody else prays the prayer, we say, Lord, come to rule in my heart. Come to guide my steps. Come to direct my paths. Come to be a light in the darkness. Thy kingdom come. Lord, I want you to rule and reign in my heart. Praise God. 
But when we pray that prayer, we also realize that God not only wants to rule in our hearts, but He wants to rule in the hearts of His people everywhere. And so when we say, Thy kingdom come, we're also praying for the church. We're praying for New Life Church to grow and expand and do the will of God, to have an impact upon the city of Austin and surrounding areas. When we say, Thy kingdom come, We can expand that to say, Lord, bless the leaders of our church. Bless our pastor. Bless the preachers. Bless the worship leaders. Bless those who are teaching Bible studies. Bless us as we work together to proclaim the kingdom of God in Austin, Texas. Thy kingdom come. We also, by that prayer, we pray for the work of God around the world, expanding from here throughout Central Texas, our daughter works and our neighbor churches, and on to Texas, the United States, and literally around the world. And so when there's a massive earthquake and avalanche in Nepal, we pray for our believers in Nepal. When there is a a massive hurricane or cyclone in Vanuatu, we pray for our church in Vanuatu because we want God. God's rule and reign to be extended all across the world. And we want spiritually people to come into the kingdom of God. And we want their needs to be supplied. And we want the church of God to grow until the coming of the Lord. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Imagine what it must be like in heaven. We can only dimly perceive what heaven must be like. And we read in the book of Revelation uh, a visionary depiction of heaven. We see the innumerable host of God, the saints of the ages, the angels of heaven. When God speaks, everybody listens. When God tells the angels to do something, they do it. In heaven, the will of God is perfectly manifested. There's no sin in heaven. The one time that sin began in heaven, uh, the devil and those who followed him were instantly thrown out of heaven. Sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. There's no place for sin in heaven. There's no place for carnal human ego in heaven. There's no place for selfish human desires in heaven. Whatever God says is true and is so and comes to pass. God wants the same thing to happen on earth. God wants our lives to be characterized by praise and worship, even as heaven is so characterized. God wants us to hear the word of God on earth, just as the angels hear it in heaven. God wants us to go forth and do the work of God, just as the angels of heaven do his bidding. God His will is done in in heaven. So also he wants it to be done on earth. When we pray that prayer, we begin to understand what prayer is really all about. Sometimes we think of prayer as a list of things that we want from God. And certainly petition is part of prayer. But prayer is not primarily trying to twist God's arm to do what we want. Sometimes people approach prayer as if God doesn't care or God doesn't really want to help. But if I pray hard enough, I will force him to do it. If I put enough hours in, if I say enough repeated prayers, then he was going to have to do it reluctantly. He will be forced to conform to my will. That's a misunderstanding of prayer. Prayer is not a means of working for what we want. Prayer is not a means of manipulating God, but prayer is a means of aligning our will to God's will. God already wants to help his people. God already has a plan to help people. We're the ones who lack knowledge and understanding. So when we pray, it's not as if God doesn't know our problems. He knows them very well, and he already has a plan for them. But when we bring our knees to God, we say, God, you're well aware that I'm going through a trial. And I know you have the answer. I know you've already seen the path that I need to take. You already know how much grace I need to overcome. You already know what kind of wisdom it will take to do this. So now, Lord, I'm submitting this need to you, asking for your wisdom, asking for your grace, asking for an answer from you. What do you want me to do? Do you want me just to stand here for a little while longer until you work it out? Do you want me to aggressively move forward in a certain dimension? What is your will, Lord? Because I know when your will is done, the answer will come. Praise God. And so prayer 
is learning to bring our needs to God and giving God permission to act according to his will. Prayer is bringing our church to God, our world to God, our neighbors, our family to God, and asking God to intervene by his grace, asking God to direct us, asking God to pour out his spirit upon us. It's not about our kingdom. It's about God's kingdom. Sometimes in prayer, if it really, if somebody were hiding in the corner listening, they might get the impression it's about our kingdom. I need some more money. I need this. I need that. I need that. I need an advance in this way and that way. If our prayers are really focused on what we need and we want, there's not a lot of confidence that God will answer according to what we want. But if our prayers, obviously they involve us and our family and our church and our friends. But if our prayers about, are about bringing God's will to pass in our lives, then we can have a high degree of confidence that our prayers will connect with heaven and surely it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray against the will of God, it's a foolish prayer. Sometimes God may even allow us to go that direction, to teach us his will. Sometimes he will give us what we ask for, but it's not always what's best for us. I think every prayer, whether we articulate it or not, there should be a little asterisk with a footnote at the bottom saying, Lord, if what I'm asking is not according to your will, just please disregard it. Please strike it out. In my ignorance and foolishness, I might ask for something that's got good for me. If you see that it will be against my own best interest, against your will, then please feel free to ignore it, amend it, and fix it the way it needs to be. Not my will, but your will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you know what? When we pray that kind of prayer, sooner or later, it will come to pass. There is coming a day. There is coming a day when the Lord will establish his kingdom on this earth. It will cover the whole earth. There is coming a day when there will be a judgment and all sin will be judged and all unrighteousness will be forever separated from God. And God's rule will fill the universe. His will indeed will come to pass in the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth. I want to be part of his kingdom. I want to be part of his will. I don't want to be outside the kingdom. I want to be in the middle of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And I want to be part of it right now. I don't want to wait until the judgment to submit to God's will. I want to submit to God's will right now so that I can be part of the process. Hallelujah. The kingdom, the power. If you'll notice David's prayer, he spoke of the greatness of God the power of God, and the victory of God. And I want to tell you that in the New Testament church, we have the power of God in even greater dimension than David knew about. We read the stories of the Old Testament, and they are truly amazing. When you read the miracles of the parting of the Red Sea for the nation of Israel, God giving the law on Mount Sinai, and we could go throughout the Old Testament and see the battles that David won by the power of God and see the miracles of healing, deliverance, raising the dead. But those miracles cover thousands of years of history. They hit the highlights for the average daily life. People did not see miracles. They did not experience the presence of God personally. Perhaps when they came for corporate worship several times a year on Passover, for example, or the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Trumpets, as they worshiped God, perhaps there was that sense of awe in the presence of the Lord. And someone like David, as he was inspired by God to write Psalms, no doubt he felt the presence of God upon him. As he faced Goliath the giant, no doubt he felt the presence of God encouraging him and giving him victory. But on a daily basis, it does not appear that even the prophets and priests and kings felt the presence of God every morning and every evening. It does not appear that in their daily lives they were able to enter into the presence of the Lord. 
Lord. On grand ceremonial occasions like this, they made much of coming into the presence of the Lord. But under the new covenant, when we're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Bible says we have the Spirit of God dwelling on the inside of us. The greatest prophet of all, at least as great as any revealed in the Old Testament, was John the Baptist. But Jesus said, even though he was the greatest of prophets, the least who is in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Does that mean the least of us is more holier than John, more anointed than John, more called than John, more spiritual than John? I don't think so. I think it's talking about privileges. I think it means the least child of God who comes to the altar of prayer, whether it be literally up at the front or in the back prayer room or driving home at night singing songs of the Lord or kneeling at your bedside at night. When you enter into the presence of God, you have a greater experience than John the Baptist was able to receive. You have a greater experience when you begin speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. When you begin shouting out praises to God. When you begin dancing before the Lord. Yes, David had that on at least one occasion, but we can have it day in and day out. We can enjoy the presence of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have the power of God in a greater way than the saints of the Old Testament. Power over sin so that when temptation faces us, we don't have to crumble and fall. But we can resist the devil and he will flee from us. We can make a decision to do the will of God and the power of God will sustain us. Power over the devil. He cannot force us to do anything. Even if you are literally in bed in the middle of the night and you're awakened with a spirit of fear and oppression and you feel like there is an evil presence smothering you, don't give in to that fear, but begin to say, In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. What that means, Jesus died for my sins. I have a right to call upon his grace right now. And I promise you that fear will dissipate. That oppression will crumble. That attack will be reversed because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the Holy Ghost. Greater, the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, one child of God, all by yourself, alone, in the middle of the night, you have more power than the devil of hell himself has. In God, you can be victorious, for thine is the power. It's not the devil's power. It's the power of Almighty God made available to each believer. Oh, hallelujah, we ought to praise the Lord right now. We have power over every opposing force. And ultimately, as David said, we have the victory. I promise you, if you'll keep walking by faith, you will have trials. And sometimes they will seem to overwhelm you. But keep walking by faith. The end is not yet. I've lived long enough to see it come to pass. Many times I've faced trials and many times I've faced attacks. And I've tried to just follow the Lord. And if you look maybe five years, ten years, even twenty years, you see the rest of the story. You see what happens to those who persistently oppose the will of God and oppose the people of God. You may not see exactly what's going to happen at the moment, but if you just keep living by faith, you just keep walking by faith, in the end, God's plan is going to be victorious. The people who do the will of God, they will triumph. The people who oppose the will of God, eventually they will fail. Sometimes we may never see it in this life, but whatever we don't see in this life, we will see in the life to come. But I've been amazed to see how much comes to pass in this life. How much comes around where the will of God prevails. As someone famously declared, the good thing about serving God You know, it's like when you read a novel. Now, I don't recommend this, but some people love to do this for some reason. You read a book of suspense or mystery or struggle. Some people just can't take it. 
and say, go, they go to the back of the book and see who wins. And then they enjoy reading the rest of the book. Well, that's, you know, that, to me, that spoils the suspense. That spoils the fun. But for some people, that's what they like to do. But in the case of our Christian life, I do kind of want to know that the suspense is only temporary. So I do recommend going to the back of the book. And when you go to the book of Revelation, you will find out who wins. In the end, Jesus Christ comes with all of his saints, and he defeats all the enemy. I want to tell you, when you read the back of the book, we win. When you read the back of the book, we win. It's the blood-washed company of saints that are going to rule and reign with Christ for eternity. We will be kings and priests unto our God. Oh, praise the Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. David's prayer mentions the greatness of God, the glory of God, the majesty of God, how that God is exalted. I want to declare God alone deserves our worship. He alone deserves the glory. Now we can use the term praise in a limited sense. We can praise people. And so when we talk about how much we appreciate our mothers, that's praise. That's okay. But even there, it's reflected praise. We should recognize that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. Any praise we give to people it's like the reflection on the moon. There is light that comes from the moon, but the moon does not generate its own light. The moon only shines upon us to the extent that it reflects light from the, from the sun. Even people that don't know God, whatever they do that's noteworthy, virtuous, praiseworthy, it's because humans were created in the image of God. It's only a reflected glory. So we can justly praise heroic people but only in a limited sense, knowing that worship belongs to God alone. We don't pray to any other human being. We don't pray to angels. We don't pray to saints. We don't pray to Mary, the mother of Jesus. We can praise them for the good things they've done. But when it comes to worship, when it comes to prayer, when it comes to adoration, when it comes to glory, God alone deserves the glory. God alone deserves the worship. God alone is the object of our prayer. Praise God. He alone deserves the glory. He said, I will not give my glory to another. If you read the book of Isaiah, from which I just mentioned that statement, we find God known in the Old Testament to his people as Jehovah or Yahweh, the unique name. You see, the word God is generic. All the religions have a God or gods. But the true God was known in Hebrew as Yahweh. He was known to his people in the Old Testament. And we usually say it in English as Jehovah. And so Isaiah is very clear. While there are different gods as far as the world is concerned, while there are idols that various people worship, these are not gods at all. Uh, Jeremiah, the same way, they explain, isn't it amazing that a a person will chop down a, 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 a piece of wood, he will chop down a tree in the forest, and he'll cut it up into pieces. And for part of it, he will light his fire and cook his food on. And the other part of it, he'll make an idol and bow down and worship. Idol made with his own hands. That he has the power to destroy himself. Part of it he destroys and part of it he worship. How foolish is that? He says worship of the idols is ridiculous. There's only one true God. And so Isaiah declares he is the creator. This God also is our redeemer. You see, we worship God because he created us. He gave us life. Without God, we wouldn't be here. God, everything we have, it ultimately comes from God. Our, our life itself, our strength, our health, our world and all of its beauty. The only thing that is bad is what has been marred by sin. But what God created is wonderful and beautiful. So everything we are, we owe to God. And so he alone deserves to be worshiped because he alone has created us and given us light. He alone is our heavenly father. But Isaiah also explains that he alone is our redeemer. 
God is the only one who can redeem us out of the sin in which we've uh, gotten involved in. He alone can bring us out of bondage and slavery. He alone can pull us out of the miry clay. He alone can heal us. He alone can restore us. God alone is our Savior and Redeemer. He alone forgives our sins. And so we worship Him not only because He created us, but we worship Him because He has redeemed us. And now we belong to him in a double sense. Now we owe everything to him in a twofold sense. First of all, by creation. Second of all, by redemption. That's why there's no room to glory. If you excel on your job or at school or even at church, well, that's great, but you owe it to God. Whatever you're able to do, it's only by the grace of God. You're just one breath away from oblivion. You're one heartbeat away from oblivion. It's only by the grace of God that you're able to stand. It's only by the grace of God that you can do anything. So he alone is worthy of the glory. Praise God. He's the only creator. He's the only redeemer. And Isaiah explains he's the coming king. Isaiah 35 talks about your God will come. When your God comes, the lame will leap like the deer. The eyes of the blind will be open. The poor will hear the gospel. Your God will come and he will save you. Your God is coming. Your God is your king. He's the holy one of Israel. And so We worship God because He alone is our Creator. He alone is our Redeemer. He alone is our coming King. But what's so amazing, the Old Testament also prophesies, including that same prophet Isaiah, and the New Testament reveals explicitly that God was manifested in the flesh. He's known to us as Jesus Christ. That name Jesus is the new covenant name that separates the true God from all the false gods. Do you want to know who is God? Which one is God? Is Baal God or is Allah God or who's God? Is it the gods of the ancient Chinese or is it the God of ancient Africa? Who is it Buddha? Is it Muhammad? Is it The the gods of the various religions. Well, I'll tell you how you can know the true God. He has been revealed in the name of Jesus Christ. When you call the name of Jesus, you're calling the redemptive name of God. The name by which God revealed himself. The name God chose in his human identity. It means Jehovah Savior. Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of the Old Testament has become my personal Savior. And that's why it's not shocking to know that the New Testament says Jesus is the Creator. The New Testament says Jesus is the Redeemer. The New Testament says Jesus is the coming King. We're looking for the return, Titus 2.13 says, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There should be no doubt as to who we worship and to whom we pray. It's in Jesus' name. We pray to God in Jesus' name. We pray like Stephen as he was dying. He looked up into heaven and he saw the glorified Christ and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He prayed to Jesus because Jesus was the visible revelation of the invisible God. Hallelujah! We worship Jesus with the worship that is due to God alone. Because we know Jesus is the one true God manifest in the flesh. He is our creator. He is our redeemer. He is our coming king. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We owe it all to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, praise the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And something is shaking in our world today. I preached at the General Conference in St. Louis in 2014. I made a statement that I felt impressed, that God impressed upon me. That in 2015, we would see a transformational year. And I explained how the United Pentecostal Church International, which this local assembly is part of, that some years ago, we went through some struggles financially. We even suffered some slight losses. But then... After a few years, we started picking up speed and we started growing again. And so now God has blessed us and 
We're stronger financially than ever before in our history. We have more churches than ever before in our history, more ministers than ever before, more new ministers coming in and receiving their ministerial license than ever before. And so things are moving forward. But I feel that God wants to give us a transformational year. Some of you have heard bits and pieces of this, but I want to rehearse it, to put it all together, to show that God is doing something in our world. He is establishing his kingdom. He's demonstrating his power. And it's all for the glory of God. But something is happening in our world today. And so at the general conference, we had 26 missionary families that we wanted to send back to their field. Normally, they have to travel for one or two years throughout the U.S. and Canada to raise their support so they can go back. But we felt the urgency of the hour. And we calculated that if we would raise $4.4 million, we could send, we could fund all 26 families for four years, which is their term of service. And we could just send them immediately back without having having to take another year or two away from their field. In that one night, in previous years, we'd raise as much as $2.6 million. But in that one night, we raised $4.3 million. And that's not counting the, the cars and businesses and other pledges that were made. And so I'm happy to tell you that we did notify all 26 families that they could go back to their field. And we're still notifying families as the money has come in. We've had additional family or two that we've been able to notify. You can go back to your field. We've already raised your funding for four years. That is miraculous. That's transformational. God is doing something. So that's global missions. And then our North American missions, which focuses on building churches in the United States and Canada. Two years ago, you, you may be aware we have a Christmas for Christ offering where we ask all the churches to give. And it strictly goes to to planting new churches. 40% stays in the home district and 60% goes to the to North America for churches, not for other things, not for administrative purposes, but for church planting. And so two years ago, we had an all-time record of $3 million. We rejoiced to break that barrier. Last year, of course, you always hope to increase a little bit. You'd like to break your record again, but sometimes when you have a record, you don't quite make it. It might be some years before you hit back to that record because you made a heroic effort. But we did break that record. And so I would be excited to tell you we raised three million and a hundred dollars or three million and a thousand dollars or three million and fifty thousand dollars or three million and one hundred thousand dollars. But actually we raised three million six hundred thousand dollars. Shattered the all time record by six hundred thousand dollars. And that does not count $1 million given directly to metro missionaries. That is to our large cities where we have missionaries on assignment. So something is happening in missions giving, not in other parts of the world, but also right here at home. And then our youth program, we, every two years we have a North American Youth Congress. And it's very interesting There are various Christian conferences that pull people from all kinds of denominations, parachurch meetings, and some of them have reached uh, tens of thousands. But for one denomination or one organization, the North American Youth Congress of the United Pentecostal Church International is the largest of any denomination in North America. That's really amazing because... In the big scheme of things, we're not nearly as big as the mainline denominations or even some evangelical or Pentecostal type churches. We're not the largest by far, but we have the largest youth event, national youth event of any one denomination. Four years ago, we had 15,000, which was a record. We have to plan about four years in advance. So if you had 15,000 people, how big of an auditorium would you plan for? If you plan too small, you cut off growth. If you plan too big, you can't pay for it. So how do you do it? And so by faith, they stretched and they booked uh, arenas that would seat 18,000. That allows for a pretty sizable growth. Well, two years ago, we hit 18,000. This year is the next Youth Congress. When we opened the registration 
online registration. In 14 hours, we had 18,000 registrants. The people who decided to wait one day couldn't register. And so what we did is we rented the hall across the street. We've got a live video feed. That's not quite as good, but we're letting them come for free. Guess what? The registrations are at 22,500 so far. Even though those extra 4,500 people know that they're going to be across the street. And so now we're looking at two years from now, what are we going to do? Our 18,000 seat auditorium is not going to work two years from now. So we're having to scramble to figure out what to do. Now, I shared all that to say, do you see a common thread here? The common thread is we plan, we pray, we work hard, we try to make progress. And based on our efforts, we would expect an increase. We would expect growth. We would expect to achieve. But in every case, what God has done has far exceeded our ability to do it. I'm saying God is intervening. There is a spirit of transformation. Something is happening in the realm of the spirit. God is showing up and reminding us, for mine is the kingdom, he says. For mine is the power, he says. For mine is the glory, he says. It's not about our kingdom. It's not about the United Pentecostal Church's kingdom. Yes, we must do the work. Yes, we must pray the prayer. Yes, we must have plans. But God is saying, I'm in charge here. It's not based on your works. It's not based on your ability. But it's based on my will and my power and my glory and my kingdom kingdom. Praise the Lord. So we had a general boarding board meeting in March of this year with leaders from all across the U S and Canada. And as we begin listening to these reports, we begin to realize God is doing something that's not on our agenda. God is doing something exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think as Ephesians 3.20 says. And so as these reports begin to come in, the Spirit of God fell in that boardroom. And a spirit of prayer and praise began to permeate the boardroom. And for about one hour, we as leaders began to worship God and pray. And different leaders stood up and began to prophesy. They gave tongues and interpretation gave scripture on their heart. They felt God was using that scripture to speak to us. And some of the elders, I remember one man, an elder got up and he said, you know, I've been involved in many things over the years. And some decisions I made, I feel were wrong. He says, I feel like I need to apologize. If there's anything I've done over the years that has been wrong, I want you to forgive me right now because I don't want to stay in the way of what God is trying to do. Another elder got up and said, I've been on this board for 40 years. He's an honorary member. And I've never seen God work the way he's working right now in our boardroom. Something is happening. At the end of that hour, a prophecy came forth, which I'm claiming. And I believe all across the United Pentecostal Church International, including this assembly, we ought to claim this promise. The prophecy said, you have seen unprecedented giving. And you have seen unprecedented participation. Now you will see an unprecedented move of my spirit. There was a witness to my spirit. We've been working hard for the last few years. And we're seeing God's people rise to the challenge. We're seeing faith increase. So people are giving as never before. People are participating as never before. But the difference now is God is doing what only God can do. An unprecedented move of the Holy Spirit. I don't have a lot of, I'm not going to take a lot of time tonight. But I'll just give you a few examples. All across, I've been going all over the U.S. and Canada, especially targeting, targeting our most needy areas, the places where there's the greatest population and the fewest number of churches. And something is happening. In the New Jersey Metro District, which is the northern part of New Jersey next to New York City, we only have 20 to 25 churches. In the last year, we started five churches 
When I was there at the conference, all five pastors were in the conference testifying of what God is doing. That's a huge breakthrough for one year in one of the most difficult areas of the country. When I was there a few years ago, they explained how hard it would be. It would take generations to see progress, but we've continued to work at it. We've continued to send people. We've continued to pray and motivate and provide training. And it seems like there was a breakthrough in one year, five new churches. I went to New York State, the upstate, not the metro area. Same situation. Actually, many large cities, but only have about 20 to 25 churches. I just came back from their conference in the last year. They've started five new works from their district. Again, that's a huge increase for one year. Faith is rising. Southern California, huge population. Let me tell you what God is doing. This has now happened three times in a row. We sent a whole missions pastor to a city. They trying to find a place to have church. They did what we did in Austin. They found a church that allowed them to have like an afternoon service or an evening service. And they've been having service in these buildings. And in the meantime, the congregations have dwindled to all of the, of the owners have dwindled. Pastors have resigned. Pastors have passed away. It's a few elderly people. And in all three cases, what those churches have told us, they said, can your pastor just take over and be our pastor and just pastor the whole thing? In one case, a million dollar building. Another case, a two or three million dollar building. It didn't take a long time for us to say, sure, we'll be glad for our pastor to pastor your church. We'll be glad to minister to you. We're trying to start a church here. God just gives us a free building. Something is shaking in the realm of the Spirit. That's not the only place in North Dakota. There are some denominational churches don't have pastors. Some of our preachers are riding circuits, pastoring two and three denominational churches while they preach to them the message of Acts 2.38. North Carolina, our superintendent, Brother Huntley got a vision and a burden. He looked at all the counties that didn't yet have a church. Last fall, they decided to have 10 crusades in 10 counties that had no church. And for each one, they had a mother church that would oversee it. And they appointed a pastor who would follow up on the converts. On the same day, they had 10 simultaneous crusades. They had hundreds of people receive the Holy Ghost. They had a pastor on site, and they gave the names of everyone who received the Holy Ghost to that pastor. Guess what? In one day, we started 10 new churches in the state of North Carolina. And for some reason, they want to do that again this year. They want to do it until every county has a church. Ten churches in one day. Something is happening. United Nations headquarters, New York City. One of our pastors, he's in Detroit. He's African-American. His, his wife is ethnic Korean. They had a convert in their church. She had a relative, and I don't want to be too specific, but she had a relative who came and visited, was healed of an incurable disease. In fact, this is what's amazing. She had left her job to go back to her native country to die because the doctor said she had an incurable disease. She was praying alone, and she felt God touch her. Then she went and visited her the, the, the church, and when the pastor prayed for her, she felt the same healing of God, what she had already experienced crying out to God on her own. As a result, she was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, went back to New York City and got her job back. Her co-workers began asking what happened. We thought we would never see you again. She said, well, can I give you a Bible study? And so for one year, our pastor has been going to the U.N. headquarters and the U.N. chapel building across the street from the headquarters and teaching Bible studies. He's been giving, having services. He's been using the United Nations swimming pool for his baptismal service. 
he sent me a video clip and somehow it was on the cloud and the cloud ate it, but I watched it before it was eaten. But it was five minutes before closing. And so he had a diplomat of another nationality and they baptized her in Jesus' name. She came up out of the water. He laid hands on her. She was praying quietly. And you could see the the worker in the background. It's, you know, it's time to coming to close the pool down. And so they kept praying. The clock's ticking. Only four minutes and three minutes and two minutes. And right towards the end, she just fluently just began speaking in tongues as God filled her with the Holy Ghost. So to date at the UN, he, he has about 80 attending the special services, people of 40 nationalities, diplomats and staff. And he's giving personal Bible studies. So far, 11 people have been baptized and 13 people have received the Holy Ghost at the UN headquarters. You may have seen it on YouTube, but he had an opportunity for an interfaith service to invite different people to come testify. So he invited Lee Stone King to tell how God raised him from the dead. And Brother Stone King, of course, just had to put in Acts 2.38 that everybody needs to repent of their sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And, of course, by law, there has to be simultaneous translation into multiple languages. So we were able to get the message in many languages at the same time. Is all this just a coincidence? I believe God is moving. God is saying, now you've shown what you can do. I want to show what I can do. I think God is saying, I appreciate your burden. I appreciate your prayers. I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate every soul that you've talked to, every Bible study you've taught, every uh, message you preached, every song you've sung. All that's good and wonderful. But let me show you what I can do. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory. So where are you tonight? No doubt some are going through trials at this very moment. No doubt, where where is New Life Church of Austin tonight? No doubt we have certain needs. And, And no doubt, you know, we've had things hit us. And no doubt we will in the future. No one can know what this year will bring. But through it all, I want us to see what God is doing. We're imperfect people. We struggle. We have trials. The church will struggle. The church will have trials. But step back and look at the big picture. The devil might be working, but he's not the only one who's working. God is also working. And this is God's church. You are God's people. Even in your struggle, you are God's people. Don't let the devil claim you. Don't let discouragement claim you. Don't let sin claim you. Don't let a trial claim you. Don't let anything stop you because God has the kingdom and the power and the glory. God is capable of moving in your life. God is capable of giving you the victory. God is capable of giving you direction. I'm speaking to individuals. I'm speaking to the pastor. I'm speaking to the whole church. Just remember just who's in charge here. Let's remember whose church it really is. Let's remember whose kingdom we're talking about. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So I'm not looking over my shoulder of what the devil might be doing. I'm not looking around to see what circumstances might be doing. But I'm looking to see what God's doing. I'm looking beneath the clouds to see what is God have in mind. What is God trying to do in this city? What is God trying to do in this church? What is God trying to do in your life? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Let's stand together, church. Hallelujah. What is God wanting to do? What is God trying to do? What is God doing in your life? What does he want to do in your life? What is God doing at New Life Church? What does God want to do? What is God's plan for 2015? Hallelujah. Don't be discouraged by battles, opposition, trials, or just changes of life. 
I'm here to tell you God's in control. Don't you pray the prayer? Don't you believe it? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever prayed that prayer? And maybe not always the exact words, but is that the way you pray? Is that the attitude of your heart? If it really is, Pastor Shaw, Pastor Celia, is that the, is that the, does that prayer accurately represent your vision for the church? Leadership team, church board, does that prayer really reflect how you feel? Care group leaders, ministers, does that reflect how you feel? Well, if it does, then God is hearing that prayer and God is answering that prayer. So keep your focus on what God is doing. And then you wrap it up by saying, for thine is the kingdom and thine is the power and thine is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let it be so. The Lord will confirm his word. If there is a special need in your life, if God has spoken to you in a certain way, I want you to come quickly to the front and I want you to claim your promise. Get your focus on what God is doing. God is in control of your life. He's in control of your family. He's in control of your church. Give God the glory. If there's someone that needs to repent of your sins, now's the perfect time. Someone who's never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, never been filled with God's Spirit speaking in tongues, why don't you come right now? Why don't you ask someone to come with you so that you can come together and pray? Who has a certain need? Who is stirred up to see a move of God? Who's trying to teach a Bible study? Who wants to teach a Bible study or share a testimony? God is speaking to you. God is stirring you up. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Confess it in Jesus' name. Claim it in Jesus' name. To God be the glory. Oh, let's pray, church.